Thank you very much, Charles. Um, just a few words before we start, I would like to say how much we appreciate you being with us today. Um, and we are quite excited to exchange with you about freedom of expression and democracy in Europe uh, in these two days. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking to keep time for presentation and uh, discussion. Just several points before we start. Um, each speaker will have between 15 and 20 minutes to summarize their chapters and comments. Of course, if they wish, they can respond to each other after all their presentation. And after that, we will open the discussion to the to the floor. Also, as Charles mentioned it, please switch off your microphone when you are not speaking to avoid any strange sound effects. Uh, this event is being recorded. If the speaker agrees, we will post the video on our uh, on our website. But the um, exchange with the audience will not be broadcast. So, our first panel is on the last section of our forthcoming book. It concerns the guarantees of freedom of expression, including the delimitation of the scope of this freedom, the reconciliation of freedom of expression with other rights. What is the scope of freedom of expression? How it is to be balanced against other freedoms? And what role can proportionality play in this process? To discuss all these points, we will hear from only two authors in this section, as Jörn Reinhardt cannot uh, be with us today. The first one will be Christophe Bezemek, um, Dean of the Faculty of Law and Professor of Public Law at the University of Grasse. Uh, we will also be hearing from George Letsas, Professor of Philosophy of Law at the University College London. And finally, your presentation will be discussed by Alan Arel, who is Mizoc Professor of Law at the Faculty of Law of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. But first, we will also hear from Christophe Bezemek on his talk on what do we speak about when we speak about speech. Christophe, if you want to speak, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pierre. Uh, thank you so much, Pierre and Charles Obro, for organizing this. Uh, this is a wonderful um, uh, thing going on here, and uh, I'm privileged, of course, to be part of it. Uh, as for now, I'm privileged uh, to be um, what I would like to perceive as the supporting act uh, for George Letzers and Alan Harel. Uh, both of them are, of course, uh, world-renowned legal philosophers, which is why I uh, try to give some kind of a philosophical spin to uh, my humble thoughts. Uh, the title of the paper, uh, aptly named, was what do we speak about when we speak about speech? Indeed, um, uh, uh, it came to me when I asked myself uh, a question uh, that was rather simple, uh, studying the case law uh, that I was asked to study uh, by our hosts. Uh, and the question goes like this, uh, dear colleagues, uh, what do films, uh, works of visual art, posters, caricatures, uh, what do photo burning, panhandling, initiating prostitution, wearing a badge, wearing a flower or a uniform, uh, hanging dirty laundry, scaring away fish, holding a hunger strike or sitting, collecting signatures, shouting tally who, walking slowly on purpose, uh, hiking naked, uh, pouring paint on a monument, uh, affixing a Santa Claus cap to a monument, removing, uh, removing pieces of uh, ribbon from rats, or using a restroom in public that is distinctly not using a public restroom. Uh, what do all these um, uh, uh, forms of action have in common? Well, Evidently, for our purposes here, the answer uh, is rather uh, obvious. All these and a variety of other aspects um, uh, uh, and a variety of other acts uh, have been recognized as uh, free speech either by the ECTHR uh, or by other European uh, high courts. Um, that is, and that is for the purpose uh, of my talk here, uh, speech within the scope of protection uh, of a free speech clause such as Article 10 uh, ECHR. Uh, uh, as, as obvious as this answer was, um, uh, it begs another question, um, and uh, 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 this question evidently is why? Um, because um, uh, evidently, uh, free speech clause that is worth its salt um, uh, one would assume, at least, uh, certainly cannot serve as an all-encompassing safeguard that would uh, basically cover any kind uh, of uh, human conduct. Um, uh, evidently, a right to free speech, Fred Schauer noted as much, um, does not contain a right to commit murder. Uh, 
uh, it does not commit uh, a right to drive a car, uh, it does not contain a right uh, to drive a car in a pedestrian zone, and it does not, distinctly enough, uh, contain a right to sell heroin. Um, obvious enough, again, I guess, uh, but then again, uh, the question would have to go, why? Uh, and uh, this is what I would like uh, to find out. Um, and trying to do so in this context, I think, seems genuinely, uh, genuinely promising. It was uh, Steve Schifrin uh, who uh, suggested uh, nearly 40 years ago uh, that uh, genuine progress uh, in free speech theory might uh, be made uh, indeed if commentators talked less about freedom of speech and more about speech. So this is me trying to make progress and trying to talk about speech. Um, Let's uh, start with uh, some basics um, when it comes to this. Uh, evidently, uh, free speech means more than simply the right to talk and write. This has been held aptly in U.S. Supreme Court case law. However, it does at the same time apply uh, to ECTHR or European High Court uh, case law. The ECTHR would um, emphasize, for example, that Article 10 uh, does not distinguish between the various forms of expression uh, and all means of expression, therefore, uh, are included in the ambit of Article 10 of uh, the Conve Convention. European scholarship has then moved on to describing free speech as something akin to uh, uh, freedom of individual communication uh, and seems to be quite satisfied with that. Uh, the question is, however, whether that solves anything or whether it uh, just substitutes one vague term uh, for uh, another. After all, uh, it was Thomas Scanlon uh, who put it like this, that a comprehensive idea of freedom of uh, individual communication is evidently an extremely broad class. Um, in addition to many acts of speech, he would say, and publication, it includes displays of symbols, failures to display them, demonstrations, many musical performings, uh, and some bombings, assassinations, and self-immolations. Um, so uh, the question is where to draw the line. Um, and I would like to start with where not to draw it. Uh, and this would be um, uh, the trap or the dead end. I would uh, consider it uh, that uh, US uh, Supreme Court case law uh, ended up for some time. Uh, that is uh, the pure speech conduct division uh, that uh, proved uh, to be um, uh, rather unfruitful as an endeavor because uh, we have to realize uh, speaking itself uh, is of course a bodily act. Uh, uh, what I'm doing at this very moment. Uh, and scholars such as Louis Hankin uh, a couple of decades ago already emphasized against the backdrop, there is evidently nothing uh, intrinsically more sacred about words than uh, other uh, symbols. And this brings us to a very important point and a point that I would like to stress throughout this talk. Um, all expression necessarily requires uh, the use of symbols. Uh, human language may be, of course, uh, the most highly developed variety of human, uh, human uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, symbols. Uh, however, it is uh, against this backdrop nothing more than simply uh, what many consider the normal type of uh, communicating uh, ideas. However, any conduct indeed and uh, per se uh, may be considered communicative uh, uh, if we uh, take the relevant case law into account. That of course brings many scholars to what they would refer to as a functional equivalence of speech, facial uh, expressions, gestures uh, and signs and uh, so on. Um, uh, and uh, if we take this functional equivalence seriously, uh, this would take us uh, to the point where uh, there can be no presumption, evidently, in favor of language, um, uh, even of the normal type of communication of ideas, if it was uh, to serve uh, as um, uh, a yardstick. Let's take two examples, for example. Uh, let's take two examples. Um, somebody has opened yeah. their microphone. Yes, those are all people. Okay, let's just see. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, let's take two examples, one of them uh, being sound poems, uh, such as uh, Hugo Ball's Caravan, um, uh, things that uh, evidently and in and by itself, oh, there's mm -hmm. Eric Barron. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a great admirer of your work. Very good. Thank you. Christoph, I good. switch off the microphone. Ah, you're perfect. Um, 
uh, uh, so um, uh, would that qualify as the yardstick of communication from the very outset or in the other event, um, uh, if a hiker uh, in order to scale uh, off wild boar in the woods um, uh, would go on quoting Shakespeare sonnets, uh, would that uh, serve uh, for our purpose? Here, uh, I uh, would um, submit to you uh, that it uh, wasn't, wouldn't, uh, and I would also submit that human uh, language necessarily mustn't be employed for communicative purposes uh, overall, uh, as uh, at least one of these uh, two examples may indicate. Uh, however, um, uh, we must also at the same time be quite cautious uh, not to be over-inclusive because uh, evidently um, uh, the variety of human action is vast. Johannes Masing will introduce us uh, to this uh, in his uh, chapter uh, and uh, uh, all of us aware of Paul Watzlawick's meta-communicative axiom uh, would know uh, that uh, there is no expression uh, that wouldn't also allow for an impression at the same time. Uh, so. Um, we would have to be careful uh, not uh, to pour out the baby with the bathwater uh, when it uh, comes uh, to this. Uh, in order to avoid a dead end ourselves, I think we have to redefine uh, many aspects of uh, case law as far as it is concerned with the form of expression uh, that is um, uh, uh, to be uh, protected or covered by free speech clauses, as we would learn from ECTHR uh, case law. It is not about the form of communication, rather it is about um, uh, what we may consider the signs uh, uh, which men use to communicate uh, with uh, one another, and that is um, what um, I think um, our quest should be uh, about. Um, so. Uh, 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 where we have to draw the line, I think, is where uh, freedom of communication uh, would end and mere social interaction uh, would um, uh, uh, ensue. Uh, the question is, or the quest in itself is, um, uh, how to define uh, symbolic acts as such um, and uh, uh, those acts evidently against that backdrop uh, of which we could talk about communication uh, proper. Uh, what my paper, and I can't go into details here, um, would discuss uh, against this backdrop is evidently Ernst Cassirer's um, uh, uh, philosophy uh, of uh, symbolism uh, and um, come to the conclusion that um, what we have to talk about when we talk about uh, speech uh, are symbolic acts that um, are overcoming the immediacy of the acts itself that constitute the act, uh, we may uh, put it, uh, beyond the facticity of the actual phenomenon as a medium. Uh, so um, uh, the medium in and by itself is what um, uh, we are looking for in um, a constitutive piece uh, of action in and beyond uh, itself. Um, uh, and uh, the medium uh, in its relation to the message will be at the very core of my chapter. Uh, however, um, how to define said medium is, of course, uh, a delicate endeavor um, based on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. I think we can rely safely on uh, communication theories such as established by H.P. Grice, that we need a three-partite uh, uh, interrelation uh, between uh, intention, reception, uh, and um, uh, the given context. Um, there can be no speech uh, without a willing speaker. Uh, monkeys riding Marx's capital uh, on uh, uh, a typewriter, that's a famed uh, example uh, given by Larry example, uh, but by Larry uh, Alexander wouldn't qualify uh, from uh, the very outset. However, there cannot be any act uh, of speech proper for our purposes without at least a potential recipient um, uh, that uh, does perceive said act uh, as a medium uh, in the manner uh, discussed above without requiring, of course, perfect consonance uh, between uh, the um, speech act uh, uh, as it was intended uh, and as it was received because uh, we know how uh, human communication works. Uh, it is filled with misunderstandings and so this cannot serve as a proper uh, yardstick. Um, the medium thus in and by itself may properly be considered uh, the message um, in as much as it does uh, uh, have an autonomous meaning that may be received 
uh, at least as uh, a message intended to be conveyed by a possible recipient. Uh, however, uh, this would only work evidently in a given context. Um, the uh, context that would uh, uh, constitute the medium as such makes us understand uh, what this is um, about. Uh, and uh, what is uh, intended, uh, or not only that, that it is intended to be communicated, but also that it is intended, um, uh, that also what is intended, pardon me, uh, to be uh, communicated. Uh, the European Courts uh, of Human Rights case law has been rather slow um, to uh, adapt um, uh, criteria that are relevant to support this. However, it did so uh, starting about a decade ago. Uh, US Supreme Court, for those of you who are familiar with its case law, uh, along the line of the Spence reasoning, uh, has been um, much um, uh, earlier uh, as uh, somebody uh, or as an actor to uh, define uh, criteria such as this. But they would work, uh, or so my argument goes, uh, quite. Uh, um, splendidly also for um, uh, the purposes of a European understanding if there is such a thing of free speech. In the second part of my paper uh, and uh, the draft that I sent yesterday night to George and uh, Pierre and uh, Charles and, and Alon is about 36 pages long. I apologize for that and I don't expect anybody to read it, of course. Um, uh, uh, the second part would ask whether um, all acts uh, that um, uh, are to be considered uh, communicative as media in this understanding because they have the symbolic quality necessary to speak of speech uh, in the first place um, uh, do qualify indeed. Uh, what about situations uh, of coercion? Uh, what about uh, uh, the bank robber uh, asking uh, for money uh, or the cashier's life? Uh, what about um, uh, interactions that uh, do not amount to anything more uh, than um, uh, declarations of legal intent, for example, uh, or um, uh, use other functions of speech uh, that would not uh, be uh, communicative intuitively. What about marriage vows? What about uh, 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 the classical examples such as having babies baptized and so on and so forth? What about those declarations? Uh, my argument would be twofold in this um, uh, context. Uh, first and foremost, that uh, free speech as a uh, joint enterprise, uh, as uh, Fred Schauer, whom I quoted before, uh, did emphasize, um, does require at least residual autonomy uh, uh, on behalf of also the recipient. The recipient is free uh, to uh, deal uh, with the information or the message um, received as he or she deems fit. Uh, if there is a situation of uh, mere coercion or if there is a threat of uh, physical violence uh, that uh, does not meet these uh, criteria because then uh, the recipient would only be left uh, with the options for action as dictated by uh, the speaker. Um, uh, he would be uh, or she would be as a recipient merely degraded uh, to, a, to an object of one's own arbitrariness uh, and as such an object um, uh, it wouldn't be a proper fit as a recipient uh, as developed before uh, in the pages uh, of uh, the paper that I just skim through now as I speak. Um, this, of course, does not apply uh, to declarations of intent of all kinds of source. Um, um, uh, uh, saying I do at a, very, uh, at a marriage uh, ceremony, uh, declaring war on somebody, uh, entering into a contract, evidently all these things require um, uh, autonomy to bring about the desired uh, result. Uh, it is, however, this finality, uh, or so I would go on to argue, it is uh, exactly uh, and precisely the bringing about a certain result by communicative means that disqualifies uh, these um, uh, speech acts uh, from uh, being considered uh, speech as in the sense of free speech. In particular in the US, uh, there has been a huge discussion going on in the 80s and 90s uh, when it comes to the performative uses of language uh, uh, based on J.L. Austin's and uh, Searle's uh, philosophy of language scholars uh, such as Kent Greenewald and again Fred Schauer have argued that most performative uses of language may be excluded from free speech from the very outset. Uh, so uh, 
uh, that entering into uh, cartel agreements, for example, shopping online or offline, uh, or um, uh, adopting somebody as a child uh, wouldn't be uh, even if a speech act considered speech for the purposes here because in these cases I would like I can go easily into details if you would like to discuss this further later on um, uh, but um, uh, for now it may suffice uh, issuing these utterances uh, does uh, in the end um, uh, perform an um, uh, an action in and by itself. Um, uh, a contact is concluded, uh, a marriage uh, uh, is uh, entered uh, into, a baby is baptized and so on and so forth. So what it uh, refers to is basically nothing more than the finality of an act not open to interpretation or acceptance by an autonomous speaker in and by itself. This may vary in different contexts uh, that I have no time uh, to enter into, but are uh, of course included in uh, my paper, but overall performative utterances uh, would not qualify uh, for uh, the purposes that we have to consider uh, here. Um, these um, uh, acts, uh, therefore, uh, uh, do not um, uh, amount to speech proper as communicative acts as defined uh, before. They do so, however, uh, not based on a content disqualification because free speech, uh, as at least as I understand it, based on European case law, um, uh, we have many examples from various jurisdictions, uh, remains its content uh, neutrality. It is a structural discussion uh, that uh, is uh, being pursued here and that's a structural discussion, I think, that has um, sound arguments uh, for it um, when it uh, comes uh, to uh, its uh, foundations. Uh, I would like to conclude because I have spent my 20 minutes, uh, therefore, by uh, simply adding uh, one more sentence. Um, uh, what is it uh, we speak about? Uh, speech, um, uh, there's two things uh, we have to consider here. There's a lot of things that we don't speak about, uh, and uh, that's oddly enough, we don't speak about speaking, we don't speak about writing, um, and um, we don't speak about many forms um, of uh, things that would not be considered um, uh, a problem if speech for our purposes wasn't um, what uh, is commonly considered a term of art. This term of art um, speaks about communication when it speaks about uh, speech. That is, of course, nothing more than communication properly understood. Properly understood, of course, means uh, exclusively for this purpose, my understanding, but I'm very happy to discuss this, my understanding with you. And Alon will tell you whether this makes any sense. Um, I'm very much looking forward to that. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, Christoph, for this lively presentation and for your perfect timing, uh, despite little interruption. Um, without any transition, I would like to pass the floor to George Letzas for a presentation entitled Does Europe Believe in Free Speech, Liberalisms, Proportionality and Balancing? The floor is yours, George. Thank you, Pierre, uh, and thank you to you and Charles for the invitation. I, I'm really honoured to be part of this distinguished a list of authors and speakers, um, and in my 20 minutes, I'm going to give an overview of the paper uh, that I've sent. Um, it won't be as uh, rich, my presentation won't be as rich and rigorous as Christoph's, but hopefully the um, uh, the, the talented mind of, of Alon will be able to impose some coherence and order uh, in his comments. So um, I, I'm going to do two things in the paper. The first one is to present the main features of the European conception of free speech as a, as a legal right, and then see how that model fares against what I think is the most stringent defense of free speech within liberalism. Uh, I, I'll say more what I mean by that, but uh, I was intrigued by a worry many progress, progressive liberals have about the European um, protection of free speech, and in particular, the upholding of restrictions based on uh, hate speech or or uh, speech that uh, offends religion, and and many people, including myself, have always been a bit uneasy about that part of the case law, uh, and I think the organisers here uh, do um, very well to invite thoughts on how the methodology of the European of European courts, and in particular of Strasbourg, uh, facilitates or inhibits or how it, it relates to the foundations of free speech. 
as a legal philosopher, I think that's very important. We don't only want courts to get it right. We want courts to get it right for the right reasons. So the way the way important institutions like the European Court goes about reasoning about rights and free speech is very important. And, and so that's why I want to identify how the European Court does things and then raise some questions about how uh, this coheres, if at all, with what I think is the best possible defense of, of free speech. So I, I want to begin by um, just uh, stating the obvious that the European model has a very, very big entry point. So the gates are really open. The test of scope, what it means for a liberty to fall under right of the CHR, that's a very low threshold. So it has a massive big door to get in, but it has a very small exit. So uh, even though the court is very liberal in allowing claims to be heard, under Article 10 and other articles of the Convention, what you get in the end is very minimal because at the very end of the judicial process, you have the test of proportionality that a court, that a court uh, uh, implements. And part of that test includes, for many people, these two ideas of balancing and the marginal appreciation. So I'll talk about this in a minute. But it seems to be a model which doesn't really care about whether some liberty, the quality of the liberty, falls within the protected scope of the convention. Uh, the court has received a lot of criticism about this, uh, particularly many um, domestic jurisdictions don't follow the court, the European court in this respect. Some European jurisdictions, some domestic jurisdictions do spend a lot of time on the scope test, on what falls within the ambit of the right. The European court has been criticized for not really taking much time on that. So uh, any, uh, the, the court will, uh, as, thing, as Christoph suggested, will take uh, a very broad understanding of what is speech or association or privacy, and then move quickly to look at whether the restriction was proportionate. Now, when you look at the list of restrictions uh, in the ECHR on the so-called qualified rights, one is stunned by the number and type of restrictions that are deemed legitimate, sorry, about the aims for which a restriction can be made. Now, uh, this, to begin with, is a bit of a problem if you are a, a type of liberal that wants the, the restriction to be justified, not the liberty. Uh, so textually speaking, you have a lot of restrictions uh, and, and some of them are problematic, like, like public morals, which you have in Article 10. So to begin with, you have a textual world there about whether some of those aims should be there in the first place. But also you have no really, the text gives no uh, indication of what it means for a restriction to be necessary or proportionate. Uh, to the legitimate aim. Uh, this is something courts have developed, um, and the European Court in particular, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a broader question there about whether this process of asking is some restriction proportionate to the legitimate aim, whether that is a good method of going about testing whether some right has been violated. Um, now, uh, one thing I want to, uh, one of the main arguments I want to make in the paper is that uh, it's not really the method that's the problem. But the underlying rationale for the method, which is the idea, uh, I'll put it as follows, that the normative, normative ground for protecting free speech is a function of the category to which it belongs. So the European model, uh, and again I'm using Strasbourg here, is committed to the view that the category matters of expression. And I want to raise some skepticism about whether this is the case. Now, examples here are obvious. So if you think about speech that offends religious doctrines or uh, disparages religions, uh, the court thinks that belonging to this category of speech gives it less protection because you have to balance that right against freedom of religion of others not to be offended and against the positive obligation of state to take measures to ensure tolerance in society. Now, seemingly, the rationale here seems to be egalitarian, democratic and progressive. Um, but nevertheless, it means that if your speech falls under the category religious speech, then by definition, you get less protection. Uh, it's, it, it matters to what, how much protection you get that your speech is religious or offends religious uh, beliefs. Second example here, of course, is um, uh, speech that uh, is, uh, belongs to the broader category of hate speech, such as denying the Holocaust, where the court has said the very falling under that category, if some speech falls under that category of hate speech, uh, it doesn't even qualify for protection under this HR. So under Article 17, the court has taken the view that some forms of expression are so antithetical 
to the values of the Convention that constitute abuse of right. And the court there won't even discuss it. So here, interestingly, there's absolutism, but absolutism on the basis of the restriction, not on the basis of the right. So Article 17. Uh, and of course, court has taken the view that if um, a, 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 a form of expression offends public morals, the domestic states are in a better position to know what counts as public morals, and therefore the court will give will grant a margin of appreciation. So here you see the operation of the this supranational doctrine of interpretation, whereby the court will defer on the judgment of national authorities about what counts as a necessary or proportionate restriction to the to, to the right to freedom of expression. Uh, so here you have a number of cases of the European Court of Human Rights, mainly under uh, speech that uh, offend either religion or public morals. So uh, art, artistic exhibitions, uh, for example, uh, where the court has said, we don't know uh, what offends people in Austria or, or, or in Ireland. We're going to defer to the judgment of national authorities about what, uh, what uh, ne is necessary in order to promote and protect public morals. So, so there, again, if your speech falls in the category of uh, offending public morals, then you get less protection because there's going to be marginal appreciation and deference. Now, as Charles said, uh, some of those features are to do with the fact that Strasbourg is international court. So the legitimacy of the court is always an issue. The court has to fight for its acceptance step by step. It has to rely on there being an emerging consensus on, on what counts as a protected liberty gender convention. Uh, these are all well-known features. I won't go into them. Uh, I think they are very problematic uh, because one of the things that rights should do is protect individuals against majoritarianism particularly moralism that is based on what the majority thinks or considers unpalatable. When the court defers on the judgment of national authorities about what counts as an offense to public morals, it offends its own role as the guardian of rights because it doesn't really examine whether some restriction is uh, justified. It defers to the national authorities. So therefore, in a way, it defers to the majority against which it's meant to protect individuals. So, so that is a very problematic feature of the marginal appreciation. I call this use of the margin structural in earlier, in earlier work because it's not really about the nature of the right. It's more about the position of the European Court as an international court. And there's a big question mark there about whether this is justified or not. It was justified early on when the court was building its legitimacy. I wonder whether it's justified now so many years after it's been in operation. So uh, the categories of expression matter to the court. Uh, and, and many of the people here and many of the people in Europe uh, often think that if the restriction is justified for a legitimate aim, such as promoting pluralism, tolerance, or protecting minorities, then that is legitimate and the court is right. So uh, progressives are not necessarily skeptical about this, this approach of the European court. Uh, and they do take the categories of speech to be uh, important. Uh, so the court's uh, most important uh, uh, weight, assigning weight to a category, is speech that contributes to public debate. So this is the central feature of the court. The court, uh, in many judgments, has highlighted that speech that contributes to public debate is more important than other forms of speech. Uh, in, in, a, in a judgment which I think is a very problematic, uh, the Israeli movement against Switzerland, the court said, well, if the liberty interfered with is the liberty to place an advertisement on the street, uh, that's not really linked directly to any social or political issue. Uh, so we're going to um, uh, here give a margin of appreciation. The court did not find a violation. Um, and and I, I see there the elements uh, of a view, which is that the foundation of freedom of speech, at least as a political right, is related to the function of speech in politics and democratic politics in particular. So a number of other areas of, of speech, like artistic speech, ethical speech, religious speech, stupid speech, you know, uh, aesthetic speech, anything that's not really of social or political relevance, of which there's a public debate, doesn't get as much protection. And I want to ask everybody uh, here, genuinely your thoughts, about whether the best thing we can offer a justification for free speech would identify categories of expression uh, as relevant. I'm skeptical, and and I I'm, I'm I'm trying to find the rationale for not looking at categories of expression as relevant. 
uh, in the work of in the work of early of early Scanlon, and in the work of Ron Dworkin and Thomas Nagel, as I do in the paper. Uh, but I wanna my, my main motivation is this: uh, democracy is of fundamental importance to Europe, fundamental importance behind the building of the European institutions, the EU, and so on. But democracy itself must be seen in the light of the value that grounds it, which is clearly equality. Now, my question is this, if equality also grounds the rights we have, then surely freedom of speech must be broader than whatever justifies democracy. Democracy is just one instance of the right to be treated as an equal, but it can't be the only foundation for rights because equality is this, has this broader remit. Equality would protect citizens not only when they are voting or debating social and political matters, but also when they watch art or converse with their friends or say th things that nobody has any interest, politically or socially. Uh, equality must have a role outside the narrow domain of democratic politics. So if the best justification for free speech is equality-based, then the category expression shouldn't really matter. Uh, so, and that's the gist of my of my paper to 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 raise this this skepticism. Now, uh, those of you who have read the paper will see that uh, I make a big fuss about uh, early and, and late Scanlon. Uh, early Scanlon uh, begins his uh, theory by making it explicit that he wants to provide the theory of free speech that doesn't really take the category expression to be constitutive or relevant to justify why speech should be protected. And he draws this, I think, crucial distinction between looking at the illegitimacy of a restriction on speech and looking at the illegitimacy of the reason for restricting speech. And I think that this is really, really marks out a big divide between instrumentalist and non-instrumentalist theory of free speech. Why would you even look at the category? You would do so for two reasons, either because you think uh, consequentially as a matter of consequentialist outcomes, by protecting political speech uh, or by banning hate speech, you are more likely to achieve good state of affairs. So we know if you restrict uh, religious speech or if you don't protect religious minorities, this causes tensions. Uh, we know that if you censor uh, political parties, this causes tension, civil unrest. Uh, so one reason why you would uh, highlight different categories is a prediction about the consequences of allowing or banning this or that speech. Uh, very few people will mind um, uh, banning, uh, making a defamation a civil wrong or um, restricting or regulating commercial speech, but we mind more when the state regulates uh, political speech. So, so one idea here might be, oh, you would identify categories because of the consequences, right? That's, that's a purely instrumental account, but it's also instrumental when you think that the justification for free speech comes from the interest that it protects. Clearly, I personally have more of an interest in political speech than an interest in artistic or aesthetic speech or commercial speech. I don't place ads. Placing an ad is not really part of my life. Even if it were, I wouldn't care so much about it. This it doesn't really determine who I am. For most people, uh, the interest served by different categories will be uh, variable. Now, you might say we focus on political speech because the interest protected is more important. Now, this too is instrumentalist because it assumes that there are many, very many interests involved and protecting free speech is a function of balancing those interests, which interest is more important. Scanlon's early paper is rejecting this, this approach by putting forward the idea that the right to free speech is a function of the reasons that apply to the government. So if the government's only rationale for restricting speech is that some forms of expression are subordinate, unacceptable, unpalatable, some people prefer them uh, less than others, um, so he gives the example of spreading heresy, that could never be a legitimate rationale for the government. The idea there behind Scanlon's approach, and I think it's the same with Dworkin and Nagel, is that there are some reasons for which the government may never restrict speech. And that applies across categories. So uh, often this view by early Scanlon, Nagel and Dworkin is presented as an autonomy based view. But they understand autonomy again as an interest. And then they say, well, yeah, sure, 
uh, autonomy is the foundation of free speech, but you have to balance this against pluralism and tolerance and other collective values. So they have to be this balancing. Uh, now, that's the wrong reading of the early views canon. The, the reading I propose is that it's not about the participants, it's not about the audience or the speaker, it's about the government. Can the government really apply itself coercively on citizens by taking sides on express views, even if those views don't relate to politics? By telling us that some books are better than others, some forms of art are better than others. There, and this is where the link to equality comes in, when the state does this, it sides with some citizens against others and thereby violating the very idea of equality that stands behind its role. It's the role of government to treat people as equals by taking sides between citizens merely on the basis of the view. The, 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 the state violates fundamental right of equality. So no balancing is taking place there. So it's a view where we don't balance interest. We just look at the reasons that apply to the government and try to filter and see at, on the facts of the case, has the government acting on an impermissible reason? Now, in, in other work, I have tried to project this theory to the European Court of Human Rights, and I think that the court, that's exactly what it's doing in other articles of the convention. It doesn't do balancing, it does proportionality without balancing. What <laughs> the state is really, is really doing is trying to look at the reasons for which the government acted and see whether these reasons are illegitimate or not according to the distinction by Ellis Scanlon. Uh, and I, this is where I think the free speech case law is an outlier. It doesn't really fit with the model of proportionality applied in the rest of the case law. Um, and I know why there's a historic reason for which it, why it's the case. Europe, uh, after the war, uh, has faced these problems about how free speech relates to broader concerns and anxiety about the history of violence in the um, in, in the continent about the presence of minorities, uh, of religious minorities in particular. So you can explain why it's there. Can you justify it? Can you justify cases like ES versus Austria, where some person was convicted for a criminal offense by merely uh, making bigoted and stupid comments about the Prophet of Islam? Um, can we really justify uh, the position of the court that uh, there is a right not to be offended which has to be balanced against um, against the right to offend. Uh, the early, the very first early uh, case that Charles mentioned, Handicide, um, uh, is it, it, really um, nothing has changed since. Uh, the court said the protection doesn't really uh, is not restricted to favorable ideas, but ideas that may shock, offend, or disturb. Uh, in the, that motto. Uh, never became reality because uh, still in, in ES, like uh, so many years later, the court did not find uh, a, a violation. It's lip service to the idea that people can say stupid and bigoted things, but the very foundation of free speech, if the government is to impose itself coercively, uh, it, it has to allow for this. There's a beautiful phrase, I think, that captures what I think is the problem about the case law by Thomas Nagel. Uh, when, um, uh, when, we, uh, when the bigot uh, or is, is, is censored, it offends us all. So here, democratic politics actually stands on the other side of the equation. If we really care about democracy and equality, uh, we should, I think, rethink the approach uh, on, on categories of, of expression, in particular uh, offensive and hate speech. Thank you. Thank you, George. And um, again, thank you for this very perfect timing. Uh, in your presentation. Uh, I, I assume that, that your defense of liberal interpretation of freedom of speech should create a very interesting exchange between us. Uh, before that, I would like to hand over the, to Aaron Arel for his critical discussion of these two presentations. Uh, Aaron, the floor is yours too. Your microphone is cut, switched off. Uh, you speak in the void. Yeah, now? We, we listen to you. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, so I have two uh, apologetic comments. The first apologetic comment is I have to apologize to Christoph for infecting half of his faculty in uh, COVID a few months ago. Um, and the second is that uh, I will have to live in the middle of the next section. I will be here tomorrow, though, but um, I have to live in the middle of the next section. Uh, let me start with Christoph's uh, analysis. 
this the paper is is incredibly rich uh, and I want to say uh, so it discusses many many issues I'm not going to discuss even half of them uh, I'm going to mention only two things well, one thing very briefly um, first of all I think it's quite dangerous sometimes to use philosophical observations uh, in order to draw from them on legal issues automatically without thinking about the institutional and the or, or normative issues underlying law. So I, I recall having read a, a book by a very eminent uh, scholar philosopher on uh, attempt in uh, criminal law where he tried to uh, derive from the concept of attempt in philosophy to criminal law, and it was uh, his analysis of philosophy was perfect, was brilliant. Uh, and later on, I asked, why is the philosophical definition relevant to law? And I couldn't figure out. Uh, and I think to some extent, uh, uh, an automatic reliance on rice or these without understanding why, why their analysis of the concept of speech and communication is relevant to law, it can, can sometimes take us off. Um, and um, I, I don't have any clear example in mind, but I only think that in order to make derivations of this type, it's very important to look at what the law aims to achieve rather than to infer automatically from the conceptual uh, apparatus of philosophy um, to uh, issues of constitutional law. This is just a, a, a minor comment that I had. I want to focus on the issue of um, th that um, Christoph emphasized, namely the issue of mutuality or joint discourse that is free and autonomous. Uh, according to Christoph, and I agree with him, uh, speech has to be mutual or it has to be joint discourse. Communication, as he says, requires the autonomy of the recipient to be able to accept or also reject what has been expressed. A person must see himself as a sovereign in deciding what to believe in and in waiting uh, competing reasons for action. Christoph argued that the threat may literally be speech, but its primary effect is analogous to twisting someone's arm. Thus, a threat only symbolically overcomes the factual barriers between the individuals involved in order to erect new ones in turn that they already anticipate only remaining options for action in the communicative art. I think this is all uh, very true, but I think looking at it um, more, um, I would say, uh, deeply, we find that there is a vast literature that says something more. It says uh, that a free joint ex, uh, an enterprise requires a free agent, uh, ones who can act freely. To be an agent requires an environment which is conducive. Freedom is not merely the ability to utter a word or an idea. It ought to be freedom to participate in a discourse, and this presupposes the existence of the agents. And here I wish to uh, point out that there is um, a interesting literature, and I think important literature that ought to be addressed, uh, namely the literature that basically argues that freedom of speech is meant to be exercised, not only to exist, but to be exercised. And in order to be exercised, there ought to be certain preconditions. And some people may argue, and the concept here that I draw on is, of course, a famous uh, McKinnon uh, idea of silencing. Namely, when you live in a society uh, in which uh, you are permanently and um, immensely uh, subjected uh, to others in many, many contexts, uh, put in your place by uh, having a lot of hate speech around, by having, I mean, McKinnon uh, uses a pornography example, I'm, less, I'm more skeptical about this, but, uh, but when we live in, an, when somebody or a group lives in an environment which is permanently and consistently puts it down, puts her down, uh, and looks uh, skeptically about, uh, on her, on her views, on her abilities, and so on, so on, uh, this may undermine uh, the ability of members of this group to be full-fledged agents 
and to participate in um, in uh, kind of this free joint enterprise that is emphasized by uh, Christoph as, as is basic to his analysis of right. Uh, thus, while hate speech cannot be analogized to twisting one arm, it nevertheless uh, limits and constrains the project of free discourse by undermining the agency, agency in a full sense of minority. One way to look at it is to distinguish between what can be called um, atomistic uh, outlook on uh, this issue, on the issue of speech. Namely, okay, so uh, you are you are in the middle of a project of speaking about a particular thing. You ought to be allowed to say whatever you want, whatever you think appropriate. But the other is to look at the discourse as a whole and to um, um, contribute the discourse or to uh, create a discourse in which people feel free to uh, express themselves fully, uh, to be autonomous, uh, and, to, um, um, uh, and to speak you know, unhindered by their in the inferior status that they get in the society. I think this point ought to be uh, addressed. Uh, it could be rejected, but it ought to be at least addressed. Um, now, let me move to uh, George. George uh, contrasts two views concerning free speech, the view that he labels the liberal view, which provides deontological justification for the right, and the consequentialist justification, the former provide at least under some version an absolute prohibition on restricting speech that does not depend on categories. Uh, such restriction violates values such as dignity or equality, and such violations are uh, impermissible. Um, I want to turn again, and I want basically to mention uh, or to uh, address two things. Uh, first of all, I think to, to, to some extent, uh, the dichotomy reflects uh, the distinction between the American, the US uh, uh, version of uh, speech or protection of speech and the European protection of speech. And I think George is perfectly right in saying that this has to do something with the history and cultural and blah, 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 and things like this. Um, I am disposed these days, after having lived both in Europe and in the United States for lengthy periods of time, uh, I am disposed to think that, uh, to a large extent, the question of which version we should adopt may not be universal. It may depend on historical, cultural, and political value. The history of North America has been very different from that of Europe. The fear of European minorities may differ from that of US minorities. Cultural sensitivities, the role of the core, the fact that the US is much more uh, decentralized society than most European societies, um, the robustness of US democracy versus, I may say, the vulnerability of some European democracies. Uh, and the, so all these factors, institutional factors, and cultural factors, may uh, lead us to think that perhaps there is more than uh, one answer, the answer, uh, or there is one answer, but the one answer is an answer that depends on the particular society uh, in which uh, you live. And I, I'm not going to defend it to you, but I am disposed to think that, uh, that the fact that the US jurisprudence is so different from the European jurisprudence has to do with some of these factors. The second issue, and perhaps the main issue that I want to mention, is that, um, and this ties up with my comments on um, Christoph, uh, is that there is a view which I think overall uh, could be uh, classified or categorized, categorized as, um, I don't know if it can be categorized fully as, as uh, as deontological, as a liberal view, as uh, George defined it. But there is a view that you can uh, infringe justifiably the right of free speech when, if and only if, if and when, um, such an infringement contributes to the robustness of the discourse, to the uh, participation of large groups, to the unhindered um, uh, participation of uh, peripheral groups in the discourse. And this, I think, uh, falls uh, to a large extent in the um, uh, kind of uh, 
what uh, George defined as a liberal. It could even be absolute. It could be even that we have a duty to uh, restrict certain forms of speech uh, only and in order to uh, facilitate uh, the exercise of speech. Uh, I guess one way of uh, framing it is to say that there is a difference between having a right of free speech and exercising this right. And the important things in rights in, of the type that freedom of speech falls into, of the categories that freedom of speech falls into, is the exercise of the right. And sometimes, if we protect uh, certain forms of speech, we fail, uh, we undermine the uh, ability of individuals to exercise the rights. And I think this is uh, at least um, part of the, what I, I, I labeled it. In, in an essay I wrote in the past, the minoritarian perception of freedom of speech, but I don't think it is limited to minorities only. It is a general question of when, uh, of what is more important, having the right, the theoretical right, or the fac uh, facilitating the actual exercise. And I think this is something that ought to be addressed. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, Alan. We we have a, a, a question from Eric Barron, but before maybe George and Christophe want to answer to Alan's comment, as you as you wish. Christophe, do you want to go first? No, George. So so thank you, uh, Alan. There's great comments. Um, just very briefly on the second one, your your main point about the compatibility of the ontological view of free speech with restrictions aimed at protecting the exercise of the right to free speech by, uh, let's call them uh, disadvantaged or excluded groups, because uh, there may, may be very many. There may be, um, um, uh, you know, women, or uh, it doesn't have to be small in numbers, uh, but you might say that they are historically disadvantaged or systemically disadvantaged groups. Um, now, I, I, I find this suggestion to be incompatible with the deontological view of free speech, because the idea there is that free speech, uh, the value of free speech is derived from the contribution it makes to an interest. The interest here being to be, to participate in the discourse, effectively to participate, not just theoretically. Uh, and and the, the view I attribute to Ehrlich Scanlon and Dworkin and Nagel is that the, the foundation of free speech is not derivative from the contribution to the well, well-being. And I, I think the same with, with the Kantian approach in general. It's not the the improvement in well-being that justifies uh, uh, the free speech. Now, uh, in in the case of the um, uh, of uh, minorities or groups that are disadvantaged, we should be doing all the other things uh, for their interests. So helping them not be excluded, helping them uh, through socioeconomic measures. Can we censor one person with a view to improve? the ability to participate in the discourse of another. To me and to Nagel, this is exactly like saying the presumption of innocence should be, tail should be narrowed or relaxed to uh, respect the rights to security of others. We don't take this view. We don't say the presumption of innocence is to be balanced against security. We, we discount the harm that comes from the presumption of innocence. Why say something different for speech? Um, when when I say, oh, we restrict the bigot uh, because we want to improve the well-being of the person affected by the bigot. If we don't say the same that thing about presumption of innocence, we shouldn't say the same thing about speech either. Thank Stop. you. Uh, thank you, Alon, uh, for these wonderful comments, um, uh, all of which are, of course, very helpful and will be considered. Um, uh, I would like uh, uh, to combine the two aspects um, uh, that you raised uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, before uh, saying that, I already wrote it in the chat. So no hard feelings about the, 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 the COVID thing here at the faculty. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was the right half of the faculty, you see, because um, I was fine and, uh, and the other guys I deemed of immediate importance were fine as well, so uh, uh, all's well that ends well in the end. Uh, it was great to have you. I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in June. Um, the, um, uh, uh, the issues that you raised, yes, uh, and I think this is something uh, that will uh, maybe, um, uh, uh, maybe also be uh, raised by Eric Barron uh, as he announced this question. Um, 
why so much philosophy uh, uh, and why so little law um, uh, when it comes to discussing uh, free speech uh, on the European level? Uh, that is, I think, a, a matter of necessity, uh, uh, even though I perfectly understand your point. Um, the case law in Europe, uh, no, that's wrongly put, the European case law, uh, is uh, that is the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, is particularly poor, uh, George indicated as much, uh, when it comes to questions of scope. Um, uh, George described it as uh, the big open door, basically, and this in particular, of course, applies to Article 10 ECHR. Why is that? Simply because we follow a, a very different analytical tradition here in Europe uh, than our friends in the US do. Mark Tushnet, I think, will, uh, or Eric Barrett will attest to that. Um, uh, we don't do the job of classifying and labeling uh, as the US do, uh, based on the Chaplinsky approach, um, uh, which is still somewhat upheld, uh, and therefore there is no such need uh, to be uh, uh, particularly precise uh, when it comes uh, to questions of scope. And uh, uh, so we lack cases such as Spence. We lack cases uh, such as uh, 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 Texas versus Johnson. Uh, we uh, lack cases as Virginia versus Black, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that would allow us, uh, or Hurley for that matter, that would allow us uh, to approach these uh, questions in more detail. Uh, so now my take is, and I would like to underline this, uh, a distinctly descriptive one. Uh, I'm not presenting a normative argument. I'm just trying um, to figure out um, what's going on. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, the um, uh, philosophy employed, uh, 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 even though um, it may well be downsized a bit, uh, may only help uh, in explaining what is going on, um, simply because these guys uh, at the, that I refer to have been thinking about issues of uh, uh, language and speech and uh, communication overall for quite some time. And uh, uh, they uh, make sense of what is only then, and I think uh, so it has only an auxiliary, auxiliary function, uh, is um, um, uh, being displayed uh, in uh, ECHR uh, case law, uh, which in and by itself hardly qualifies else uh, as uh, self-explanatory. So I think a good deal of um, background is uh, necessitated in order to make sense of what is going on uh, uh, on the level of uh, coverage uh, on uh, in ECTHR uh, case law. Uh, your um, uh, second point, of course, uh, is as important as the first one. Uh, agency is, of course, uh, a core concept that uh, needs to be underlying joint enterprise that I uh, try to emphasize here, uh, and um, agency may um, be deserving of a still more prominent place uh, when it comes to this. Uh, however, it does not, I think, uh, if one is focused as much as I am on questions of scope only, uh, have this prominence in all um, uh, the uh, relevant uh, fields. Uh, if, uh, for example, um, um, uh, pornography should, uh, as um, uh, George indicated before, enjoy weaker free speech protection uh, by way of being balanced out, such as hate speech does and so on and so forth. Um, uh, Eric Barrand, I think, will come up um, uh, with uh, questions following these lines as well. Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, perhaps uh, due to diminished agency and not to the lack of agency overall. Uh, I think we both can agree that uh, as far as uh, scope is concerned, um, we will uh, have uh, to talk about uh, denying agency from the very outset uh, situations that go beyond uh, hate speech, however you would like to define it, and the definitions in Europe are not coherent, as we all know, um, uh, in uh, that uh, it would amount to uh, dictating uh, the other's behavior there, where agency uh, is denied from the very outset. We do not have a joint enterprise that would warrant uh, the designation of communication, uh, and I think uh, that is something uh, we can agree on uh, for purposes of uh, free speech against the backdrop of democracy in particular. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christoph. George? Um, we have a question from Eric Barrent, Professor Barrent. Ah. Your, your microphone is switched off. No, we didn't listen you. We don't listen you. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I got a number of comments. Um, 
and I'm going to get make a couple of points about categories of expression. But first of all, I, I'd like to make two prefatory points. I mean, one is, and I think this will be a theme throughout this conference, and that is the relationship between philosophical reasoning and legal reasoning, and to what extent philosophical arguments on the grounds for protecting freedom of speech should influence the jurisprudence of the courts, whether national courts or the European Court of Human Rights. And secondly, something which um, I've, I think, made to George in conversations before, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg should never, never be equated, and I think a lot of commentators tend to do this, with a national Supreme Court like the United States Supreme Court, and therefore to criticize margin of appreciation uh, decisions. Admittedly, the doctrine may be flawed in its application, loses, may lose sight of the fact that the European Court of Human Rights cannot be expected to treat national court decisions in the same way as the Washington Supreme Court treats the decisions of courts in Delaware or New York or Texas or wherever. Um, but now I want to move on to the two questions. I mean, one is uh, in response to some points made by George, it seems to me that categories of expression or speech are inevitable unless one is to treat speech as an absolute right as to some extent the United States Supreme Court has tended to do. If you treat, if you get rid of giving some preferential treatment to political speech with, with, in contrast to commercial speech or gossip or pornography, then you are treating anything as falling within speech and giving it the same degree of protection. So I think an approach which focuses on the categories of speech is inevitable unless one goes down the road which sometimes the United States Supreme Court has done. And the second question is really about how we treat hate speech within that approach. Is hate speech to be regarded as extreme political speech and therefore entitled to uh, uh, enjoy a high degree of protection or, and this is a question really for uh, Christoph, um, is it to be regarded as Waldron does in his book, The Harm of Hate Speech, as something like a performative utterance, like the act of discrimination? or victimization, in which case, of course, it's not entitled to be treated as political speech or to enjoy a high degree of protection. I mean, I think this is a very important question. I have no doubt, uh, others may disagree with me, that the single most important politi uh, legal question for courts, both nationally and supranationally, is how to treat hate speech. It is by far in my view, the single most pressing concern for legislatures, for courts, when considering issues of freedom of expression. I think I've said enough. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barrett. Um, it's I think easier to follow the order of Eric Barrett's question. So, George, if you want to start. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Great to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Um, right, so your, your first point about uh, the margin of appreciation, um, I, 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 I have over 20 years yeah. struggled to find the rationale for it. Um, if, if the idea is that the court should defer to the judgment of the domestic authorities as to what the right is, that seems to me a mistake of law, because the European states have given the court the legal authority to decide what rights people have. Why would then the court 
abrogate its responsibility by deferring to the authorities who authorized it to do exactly that, tell us what rights we have. So it can't, it can't be the case just because it's international that it has to be fair. Now, the rationale for it must be consequentialist. If the court goes against what most states take to be right, the states will leave the convention, they withdraw. So then the rationale, which I perfectly understand, is one of institutional stability and efficacy. Now, has anyone here done the, done the empirical work to, to, to tell us how much deference is the court going to require to remain the court that it is? Uh, I don't think we have, but my uh, you know, armchair uh, guess is that the court has already all the legitimacy it wants, it needs to decide what rights we have. Uh, and when states like Russia or the UK threaten or withdraw from the HHR, it's not to do because of the case law. <laughs> I don't think that, the, you know, if, if had the court shown a little bit more deference, states wouldn't be dropping out. Uh, I don't think that it works like that. So, so I really, don't, if, if I think it's consequential, it's rational, and I don't see uh, why it justifies all this deference. On the second point about categories, uh, Eric, uh, you're right. If you don't look at categories, you get an absolutist uh, dimension of the right, but it's qualified. So the view I have in mind here says free speech prevails with no balancing when the only justification of what government is doing is to promote one view over and over another. Um, when that's not the rationale, it's not absolute. So of course the government can ban instructions on how to make a bomb. <laughs> there, it's not as if the government is intervening and tells some of us your views are not worth. We're gonna we're gonna side with the other guys here. And, and help them. So, so it's the view is absolutely only in this conditional sense. If and only if the only rationale for restricting speech is inegalitarian, then the view is absolutely. So you don't get the U.S. the U.S. approach. Uh, and what I'm advocating is not the U.S. approach. As as many people have been saying for decades, the Supreme Court's justification is itself instrumentalist. So I wouldn't, I, I, I don't agree with Alon here either. I wouldn't equate deontological justifications of free speech with the U.S. Supreme Court case law. Thank you. Christoph, Christoph sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, very important question. Um, uh, also, I would, I, would, uh, um, uh, I would like to start again. Uh, well, it, it depends uh, when it comes to hate speech. Again, whether we uh, address this uh, from a normative uh, or a descriptive point of view. Normatively, uh, evidently, you're, uh, of course, correct. Uh, that um, uh, uh, the argument uh, uh, made by Waldron has been uh, very powerful, um, uh, the powerful counter argument, or at least a very prominent counter argument that has emerged over the last couple of years was evidently made by Timothy Garton Ash uh, in his uh, volume uh, on uh, free speech, uh, where he uh, criticized uh, current approaches when it comes to hate speech. Descriptively speaking, um, I think the question is even more intriguing, and I would like to answer it on this level. Um, uh, uh, the question uh, uh, is, um, uh, or the problem with hate speech overall is, um, it is um, hard to define uh, simply because it has been defined many times and there's great uncertainty involved uh, when it comes uh, to uh, the relevant standards as uh, how to assess it or the criteria uh, speech has to meet in order to be considered hate speech. Even uh, if we uh, were to focus on the Council of Europe alone, we would have two different sets of uh, definition of uh, hate speech. There's the Council's very own definition uh, by way of the Parliamentary Assembly uh, and uh, then there's the Court's definition and these two definitions vary and that's uh, interesting and it's um, uh, hardly ever satisfying um, um, uh, that having been said um, uh, the um, uh, uh, the way the court treats it definitely uh, is not um, uh, the way uh, one would say political speech ought to be treated uh, as high value speech um, uh, uh, and I think that is uh, uh, holds true for two reasons. Uh, first of all, in a genuine um, U.S. understanding, I think uh, it ought to be considered political speech and therefore uh, ask for, of course, very robust protection. Uh, in my opinion and conviction, at least, I'm not that sure whether there is something as a coherent political speech standard uh, on the uh, basis uh, of uh, ECTHR case law uh, from the very outset. I think uh, if we have a broad a look um, at the case law um, uh, 
the relevant uh, uh, the relevant uh, way to approach this for the court itself would be uh, rather public interest speech uh, than uh, political speech. Uh, and um, a public interest speech, it certainly is not. Uh, it is not a term used in European uh, jurisprudence. Um, uh, however, uh, it is a term quite befitting. I think the quest, the, the point in question, uh, the court certainly considers uh, hate speech to be low value speech uh, and speech therefore deserving of less protection. Um, uh, that I find perfectly plausible and I find it plausible uh, exactly uh, because of the argument uh, that has been exchanged between Alon and uh, uh, me uh, and uh, uh, first First round of our exchanges, uh, because whatever um, hate speech may in fact be, you can uh, employ some kind of Potter Stewart approach to it because you know it when you see it. Um, uh, whatever hate speech may actually be, uh, it is speech that would diminish the agency of certain individuals belonging to certain groups that are discriminated against uh, 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 because of uh, their membership. Uh, in uh, said group, thus uh, um, uh, following some kind of uh, group libel standard as has been employed in um, uh, earlier US case law, uh, diminishing uh, the uh, group's agency uh, overall. As such, of course, uh, against the backdrop, it wouldn't qualify necessarily as performative, at least in a narrower understanding. It would qualify as performative in a wider understanding, in an understanding as um, uh, employed by Judith Butler, for example, in excitable speech. Um, uh, but it would be, um, uh, it would be in any case, uh, something uh, that would question uh, or uh, even diminish uh, the recipient's uh, autonomy and thus would be deserving of lesser protection uh, than other uh, speech, typically public interest speech, which, is, which it is distinctly not, in my opinion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christoph. We have a question from Tito Green. Christoph Green. It's not just a question, but it is a brief answer to, to George's question. I think uh, the answer uh, to his question is that the European Court does not have a mandate to harmonize the jurisprudence or the understanding of fundamental rights of 47 member states, but that it only has to guarantee a minimum standard. Uh, and the answer to uh, uh, this, the solution to, uh, to this question is the margin of appreciation. Do you want me to answer to to take that? Yes, yeah. yes I, 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 if Thank you want. You. Um, yeah. So, so lawyers love metaphors, uh, and the idea of a minimum of a floor of protection is another metaphor that is you know favorite of European lawyers about Strasbourg. Uh, so Strasbourg is given a low common denominator or minimum protection, and then European states can give more. Uh, uh, by contrast to the EU, which is both a floor and a ceiling, uh, it's meant to harmonize. Uh, these metaphors only make sense if protecting rights is a matter of degree, that you can give more, more speech than someone else. And that to me seems uh, very, very misleading. Whether someone has a right to uh, utter hate speech or not is not a matter of degree. Either they have it or they don't have it. So it's not as if the court can give less and then other states can give more. Either the court gives the correct protection or it doesn't. So by, by nature, by the very nature of the European court, uh, uh, there is uh, no such thing as a minimum. They either get it right or they don't. So the marginal appreciation could only be a form of deference for what the right is. There's no more or less. Uh, so what you call harmonization is inevitable. And, and I think not realizing this is, is actually causing all the problems that we see now, where many states react to Strasbourg doing this job, uh, in my view. So, so I, I, this metaphor of minimum uh, only makes sense on a very, very consequentialist or instrumental theory of rights where you can give more or less to someone. Uh, that's why I, I felt the need to highlight the importance of a deontological approach where it's not about more or less, it's about getting it right. Thank you, George. Uh, Charles, you, are, you have a question, I think. Yeah, Good thank question. you very much to, to both of you. I had a question for Rage, but you, I think you partially answered. Um, so for Christoph, um, it's about the, the articulation of the philosophical analysis and the legal implications. 
you mentioned in your response to alone that uh, your aim was mostly descriptive to see what's going on. But I'm not sure in which sense you mean that because uh, from the point of view of philosophy of language or communication theory, it's clearly a, a descriptive analysis trying to understand what, what we can mean by speech. Uh, but it seems that from the, the concept, I mean, the, the input or what, what the, your analysis brings for uh, the understanding of uh, legal decisions and legal practice, including at the European Court of Human Rights, has to be somehow normative, right? Because we cannot assume that uh, a way to explain what they're doing is to postulate they have a, an implicit underlying coherent uh, theory of communication. And, and, and it seems what we can get from uh, clarifying with the tools of communication theory, what we mean by speech, is something which allows us to, to identify maybe uh, inconsistencies or contradictions or incoherence in, in what courts are doing and uh, maybe to to produce some standards uh, about how to to apply a scope test or maybe a more general conclusion which i thought might have been the implicit one in your paper which it, which is that this is such a complicated philosophical question that maybe the best way to go about it from a legal point of view is to completely sidestep the scope test which leaves open the philosophical question of course but okay so that's uh, that was for christoph and for George, if I understood correct, uh, correctly what you said, you, it seems to me you want to completely exclude uh, instrumental consideration. And I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure how this can be consistent with the idea that this freedom, uh, as a fundamental freedom, not just a, 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 an online one, has a political dimension or political whole. So I understand the issue about uh, free speech being much broader than just uh, a protection for, strictly speaking, political speech. But this can certainly be answered by a more general view of democracy, not just the political process of self-government in our sense, but uh, the idea of a democratic society, participation in the evolution of ideas, opinions within society, and so on, so on, and so forth. Um, and I understand the, 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 I mean, we have many theories of what democracy means when we say that free speech has a democratic dimension. Uh, depending on what democracy means for you, you'll have a different view of, of, of this political freedom. But it seems to me what's specific in democratic accounts is that they have to include uh, at least some, some proportion of instrumental consideration because one, not the only one, but one of the functions of the freedom is to make certain human activities possible, right? Uh, deliberation, criticism, uh, information, and whatnot. And so I, I wonder, so to put it in another way, it seems to me the implication of what you, you're advocating is not only uh, to be uh, um, to protect much more extensively uh, uh, religious orphans or hate speech. Uh, another consequence is we have to completely renounce associating with Article 10 uh, positive obligations, for instance, about media pluralism or a protection of journalists or access to information and so on and so forth. And uh, it seems to me all this needs to be it's an, it seems unlikely to me we can have a, 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 a view of free speech as, among other things, a democratic fundamental right uh, and completely bypass all these considerations. And final point, what I like very much in the later canon by comparison with the, the early one is precisely that uh, my understanding of it is he, he suggests a way to articulate instrumental concern and non-instrumental ones and the deontological principles. Because in the way you're balancing interests, but also threats and also justification of the protection against threats, uh, you have a kind of moral reasoning where uh, non-instrumental considerations can intervene and can trump instrumental consideration. So why not a hybrid account? Christophe, you may want to start. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Of course, uh, you got me on that one. However, I would like um, um, uh, to explain myself when it comes to this. As those of you who already know me better, people like Aaron or, or, or George or Dieter Grimm uh, know, um, uh, I'm a very humble guy. Uh, and therefore, of course, my endeavor is a humble one. Um, and um, uh, therefore, I would like to quote it. Uh, 
uh, sugar-coated maybe, is merely descriptive. Um, uh, it does have its uh, uh, normative implications, necessarily so, uh, and um, uh, uh, I'm not shying away from those. However, I'd feel more comfortable with the concept of mere rationalization uh, when it comes to that uh, than actually developing normative standards proper uh, in this context. If we can agree on that, and if it's fine for you and, uh, and, and Pierre for your volume, uh, then uh, I'll be uh, happy to leave it at that. Thank you very much, George. Charles, thank you so much. Uh, your comments giving the opportunity to um, uh, clarify the view better. I think you're absolutely right. I, I'm, I'm not advocating that democracy has no role as a positive obligations of the state to ensure the things you mentioned, like uh, pluralism, uh, proper deliberation uh, um, leading up to elections, um, uh, informed citizens, and so on. Um, and, and clearly, these do impose obligations on the state to ensure that process. So that that rationale would not be incompatible with the idea of equality uh, that I think should be central. Uh, what's antithetical is the idea that you you ban hate speech with a view to protect the equal access of some disadvantaged uh, groups to this to this process. Uh, so, so that's the thing I find problematic, particularly when you stipulate that these forms of expression are not political, they belong to another category and have low, low value, which is what the court is doing. Uh, so so I, my, my, my skepticism about democracy as a foundation of free speech is insofar as it's used to exclude categories of speech from protection. Uh, and, and, you know, like, again, like Nagel says, um, it doesn't matter whether I have anything to say of interest to others. The possibility of being censored for saying stupid things is itself a violation of a right. So it doesn't have to relate to any social or political process. So that's why I, I worry about democratic defenses of speech that isolate the category and, and say that's the only thing I will protect. Um, now, whether, whether and which forms of restriction of speech uh, the democratic justification extends to, that's notoriously very difficult. So, in my view, of course, it extends to Citizens United campaign finance. So, there's a democratic justification and actually an obligation to do that. So, I agree with you totally. Uh, but it doesn't extend, I think, to banning speech uh, like the Israeli movement, even if it's commercial. You know, I have to be able to... To, to express my view that extraterrestrials are already here and we should be, you know, we should be cloning them or something. You know, that, that's, you know, that we sh you shouldn't be able to exclude that view on the basis that it's an advertisement on the street and therefore, you know, who cares? Um, so so that, that's my view. So it's very qualified and I agree with you. And that's, that's what I like about your project is that it's, it, it forces us to look more closely to democratic justifications for restricting speech that are egalitarian and distinguish those from that, those that I think are inegalitarian, such as um, uh, offensive speech to religion. I, I genuinely don't think that banning offensive speech to religion is an a, a democracy based rationale. Uh, I don't think it's, I think it's wrong to begin with, but I don't think it's democracy based either. Uh, so that's the view. Uh, now, on scan, let's scan on the hybrid view. Um, um, yeah, so, so, so there's a bit more balancing. Uh, than in the late view, Oscano's view, than I think is, was compatible with the early view. Uh, it's a totally different outlook altogether. Uh, so the, there's some, it's not, it's not uh, aggregative, so not meant to, meant to balance numbers, but it's contractualist. So your uh, interest not to be offended against my interest to say offensive things. And, and he will say, perhaps, that some, some of those things are not even to be balanced, so my right to be offensive will prevail. In other occasions, it will be a matter of which interest is more important. Um, now, uh, you know, uh, why not a hybrid view? It's, it's a long story, but I think the hybrid view is still instrumentalist uh, and not Kantian in the way that I, I try to an, an, an analyze in the paper, because it doesn't really look at the, at the, at the status of the citizen vis-a-vis -vis the government. So what I'm trying to put forward an alternative is the nature of the agent doing the censoring. No, it's not about you and me doing the censoring, it's about the government. So what reasons are compatible with the, the role as a government? 
Uh, and that's lost in, in, in Canon's a, a approach. You don't even look at who's doing the censoring. You just look at the interest involved, yeah. And that, I think, is a difference in kind. Thank you, George. I think that we have a question from Eva Maria. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, it's first, uh, I just want to raise a concern. Uh, it's so obvious uh, when I hear uh, the different comments and presentations that that uh, my jurisdictional context is so very different from, from uh, the rest of the Europe and from the US. Uh, and you will hear more about that tomorrow. Uh, so I will not uh, elaborate on that now. Uh, but we have a very, very uh, comprehensive and detailed uh, constitutional regulation that is very unique. Uh, and that is uh, certainly um, so obvious when I hear you. And, and I also think that when the different kind of concepts uh, that are used here, uh, there are uh, examples um, uh, of many concepts that are twisted in another way than in the Swedish and Nordic context. And uh, just to give an, an example, which also ends up as a question due to that we were uh, ask to use free freedom of expression rather than freedom of speech from the editors from start. Um, and uh, when uh, Christoph, when you listed, you started your presentation, you listed uh, uh, different kinds of expressions and then you turn to uh, some of them are speech and some of them are free speech. Uh, I think this, um, um, this, uh, these steps uh, from expression to the kind of speech that is protected or under the scope of protection is uh, similar in, in uh, my context. But uh, here we talk about protected speech rather than free speech, protected under the constitutional acts rather than free speech. And these different uh, starting points really shows how we tend to start in different positions. Uh, so the argumentation does not start at the same place. Uh, and I think I'm very, uh, I, I think it will be very interesting to, to get comments on, on my presentation tomorrow because uh, my impression is that uh, the Nordic context is the most different ones from the others. So the question then, uh, Charles, I would like to hear you because now today we have used or uh, the presenters has, has, uh, have used uh, free speech rather than freedom of expression. So what are your thoughts about that? And uh, do you still think that we should um, keep to the European ex uh, expression and not the American? speech concept. Charles, if you want to answer. Well, we don't want to be too authoritarian in, a, in, a, in, a, in putting together a book about free speech, of course, or freedom of expression. Uh, our idea was uh, the following, which is that uh, sometimes terms are used interchangeably and sometimes they're not. And when they're not, in the cases where they're not, free speech is generally used to refer more specifically to either the US constitutional law or to the US tradition. And of course, in many, in many contexts, it's just used interchangeably. And, uh, but it is not, when it is not, also uh, freedom of expression is generally used either to refer to something like the European approach, or very often to like uh, international standards uh, uh, coming from the uh, international law of human right, as it is the term used, uh, not only in the European convention, but also in the, in the Universal uh, Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, what is important to us, I think, from a methodological point of view, um, is to try to find a way to uh, avoid the pitfalls associated with the fact that uh, most of the theoretical literature, especially in, in, in legal philosophy and legal theory about freedom of expression, comes from the US. And whether they use one word, uh, one phrase or the other, uh, they are heavily influenced, as, as it is natural, by uh, the US constitutional tradition. And uh, uh, something that came up quite often in the online seminar we did last year, uh, throughout 2021, 
is the fact that it is it is both a huge pool of resources of conceptual uh, resources both for le for legal scholars and for uh, philosophers but it's also uh, it brings many of those tools and conceptual uh, frameworks bring with them assumptions which might not fit the reality of what uh, 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 the law of communication is in various European legal orders. And so the idea is not to ignore, of course, uh, or not to use uh, uh, the resources offered by the literature about the First Amendment, but to be extremely watchful about uh, the kind of uh, implicit assumption uh, about what the, the legal order in which we're thinking about, in which we're thinking is supposed to look like. And so the idea uh, to stress freedom of expression instead of free speech, uh, at least in the general titles of the book, is just meant to convey this point. But then within each chapter, I mean, it, of course, it should be free to use the the, the word that makes, uh, that he or she thinks corresponds to, uh, in, in the best way to what he wants to, or she wants to say. Um, it would be better, I think, not to try and make sense of the choice of words each of us uh, does. Like not, not to use them uh, interchangeably in some part of the book and, and, and uh, in a very differentiated way in other parts of the book. But the most important is to be, to be watchful of this general met methodological uh, difficulty, uh, which is more important than the terminology, of course. But maybe others will have different opinions on this. Thank you, Charles. I, I think that we have a, a question from Alan Arel, maybe a follow up or a comment. Yeah, um, I actually wanted to defend uh, Dieter against uh, George uh, and on different grounds. Uh, I'm a newcomer to the European law. I know very little about it. I'm trying to figure out what's going on there. But I think margin of appreciation could be uh, justified on two other grounds, grounds that were not mentioned by uh, Dieter. Uh, one ground is that it is often the case that the question of whether people have a particular right or the scope of the right or the, the weight of the right may depend on factual uh, things, including, I don't know, cultural sensibilities, uh, historical contingencies, institutional effects, stuff like this. If this is the case, then perhaps uh, the scope of the rights in different European countries could differ in accordance with their tradition, with, uh, at least uh, to some extent, in accordance with their tradition, and, and thereby, uh, it seems more likely that the European uh, court will be less able to know what the scope of the right is. Um, so I could be a de deontologist and I could believe that people have rights and that um, and, and the same rights, but the question of the applicability of the right, the scope of the rights could depend on contingencies of this type. The other, the other reason is institutional. Even if we think that people have rights, there, no, there is no pressure, that, there is no minimum uh, floor of rights and, and, and more rights, but people just have rights. It's still the case that there could be a systemic uh, competencies to the national court, as opposed to the European court, such that the uh, national court would be better able to figure out, in some cases, within certain frame, what the scope of the rights is. So I don't need to buy the argument that we have a minimum floor of rights and blah, 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 uh, in order to defend the margin of appropriation. It's not that I want to defend European law. I'm just, you know, thinking these are uh, plausible arguments favoring the data. George, and after Dieter Green. Um, thank you, Alan. Um, Deference is fine on matters of fact. So any court, including in domestic authorities, may defer on, on, on factual matters. And insofar as rights, which we know, may depend on factual contingencies. So the right to self-defense depends on whether there have been a real threat to my life and so on. So was there, as a matter of fact, a real threat that is contingent uh, and there's nothing relativistic about it? Uh, and, and the court does very well to defer on matters of fact. So, for example, it takes the facts as established by domestic authorities. That's fine. The problem is when it defers on matters of law, on what makes it the case that some factor is relevant to the right. That's the deference that's problematic, and that's the one that the European Court does. And that's the point of the distinction I try to draw between structural and substantive. If the marginal appreciation is simply a way to capture the fact that rights 
may apply differently depending on the context. Does that does not work then? The marginal appreciation is redundant. If, by contrast, the marginal appreciation is a way to defer on what counts as a right on matters of law, then it's problematic. Uh, that, that's the that's the point of, of the view. Now, your other thing about competence and expertise. Um, again, you know, I, I I agree with you on matters of competence. Uh, if it's a matter of fact, then the different courts can defer to each other, or the European Court may defer to national authorities. But not on the question of what the right is. That's what I find to be problematic. Uh, your example about cultural sensitivities is ambiguous because uh, if it's a way to capture the idea of the right to be offended, for example, which the court reads into Article 9 and balances it against free speech, there, there is no more or less. These two rights conflicting, which one should prevail? The, the court cannot say, well, I'll give a minimum for, if, if, it, if it sides with the freedom of religion under Article 9, it violates Article 10, it's in the other way around. So there is no minimum there. In that case, they have to get it right. And it's, it seems to me that just like that case, all the other cases I mentioned are exactly the same. Yeah, Professor Green, do you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, uh, what Alon said is, so to say, behind my argument, why is there no mandate for the European Court to harmonize the legal systems of 47 countries? Because they are so different in terms of legal culture uh, and legal traditions. And none of the member states would have consented to the European uh, Convention if it had meant that they had to give up all their legal standards and traditions and cultures. So this is the reason for that. And the positive argument, which may not convince uh, a philosopher, but a positive legal argument is Article 53 of the European Convention that says that the European Court may no, no, not lower the standard uh, of the nation state by its uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and this is already an acceptance that there are different standards of fundamental rights protection in the various member states if it is explicitly said the European Court is not allowed to lower the standard of a nation. Just very briefly, very briefly, thank you. I, I, I perfectly see this argument and it's very forceful uh, and I see the rationale for it. And, um, you know, everybody knows the context. We have a very fragile Europe. We need to have some respect to the domestic traditions. Uh, there's a value of sovereignty, the value of national traditions about the, what the rights are and so on. My worry is this, the current situation and the metaphor of the floor and the marginal appreciation, what it leads to is a lot of normative inconsistency in the case law. Uh, it makes no sense why the court will find a violation from Turkey when someone advocates Sharia law on TV and finds no violation when Germany or Austria criminally punish someone for denying the Holocaust. What's the difference, uh, I, I want to ask? That difference makes for a very, very patchy case law, all in the name of the marginal appreciation. And it seems to me that we do a disservice to the whole project of European human rights if we allow that much of an inconsistency in the name of the marginal appreciation. There has to be some sort of principle consistency in the case law. And it seems to me that there couldn't be any unless we drop the margin. That, that seems to be a very good starting point for our last panel tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow night. Uh, in the meantime, we, we already have exceed the time allocated to this panel, so we will stop here and we will go to, to a very little break. Uh, we will start at half past four, so in 20 minutes. Um, see you see you soon in 20 minutes. Bye. Um, sorry, thank you, so much, thank, you, thank you very much for all your exchange and comments. Uh, it's a very, very wonderful beginning for our conference. Thank you. See you in 20 minutes.